Hi, welcome everyone. I'm Kelly Weston, the Director of Marketing here at Travel Leaders. We are so glad that you could join us here today. We have Tamara here from Cork Expeditions, who is going to tell you all the latest and greatest about their polar adventures. So I'm going to turn it away to her right away. And if you guys have any questions along the way, please feel free to type them in the Q&A and we will get them answered at the end of the presentation. Again, thanks for joining us. Take it away. Thank you so much, Kelly. As we hear, my name is Tamara. I am the business development manager for Cork Expeditions here in the North and Midwest of the US. My job is to work with advisors and others within the community to better understand polar expedition travel, to better understand the geography, and to help people make their dreams come true in taking off that bucket list destination, that seventh continent, that animal that they've really wanted to see for so long. I am here to answer all questions and to help make it a reality for you. So today we are going to talk a little bit about what you need to know as of 2023, who we are, what some of our updates are, and just a bit about our product. So here is a picture of me. So you can see a face to the voice that you're hearing right now. I have been in travel my entire career. Um, Antarctica was a dream of mine for a long time. I was able to visit there finally in 2018 and was lucky enough to head north this past summer to experience the Arctic in 2022. As such, these areas are such a passion of mine and are so wonderful and beautiful. And I'm so excited to help introduce them to some of you today and to hopefully make you fall in love with them too. So what is an expedition? Here at Quark Expeditions, you can tell that expeditions are an integral part of what we do. We define this as a journey or voyage undertaken by a group of people with a particular purpose, especially that of exploration or scientific research. And here is a video showcasing what that looks like. So now that we've seen a little bit about what an expedition is like, I wanted to just introduce about the experience. So who is a traditional polar client? I wanted to just put this out there as Cork Expeditions has found that we tend to have four different types of travelers into the polar regions. We categorize them into checklisters, learners, escapists, and adventurers. So who is a checklister? A checklist traveler is someone who really is looking to tick off that seventh continent. They are our bucket list travelers. They're culturally and sightseeing oriented. They're not necessarily motivated by the physical aspects of going to the polar regions. They're looking for the excitement and the experiences and what makes it new and wonderful. Our next category of travelers, we label escapists. These are our travelers who prefer a bit of relaxation in the places that they go. They're also really looking, as the name implies, to escape from their everyday normal life. They're the ones that are okay when the internet isn't quite as fast as it normally is on the ships. They're the ones that are all right being completely separated from civilization and just being in the middle of this pristine wildness. From here, we also have our learners, these are the people who become best friends with our expedition leaders. They are here to experience and learn about everything that they are there to see. These are the people who want extra context in all of their experiences and what they're visiting. They're not so much, again, motivated by physical aspects or by the adrenaline. They really are motivated by experiencing as much as possible. And then lastly, we have our adventurers. 
These travelers tend to skew a bit younger, not surprisingly. Um, almost half of them are between 25 and 44 years old, which might be a surprising statistic. A lot of our adventurers travel for slightly less amounts of time. They tend to prefer the shorter trips, uh, mainly because they are still working for the most part and just don't have as much vacation time perhaps as others. These are also people who really do enjoy roughing it a little bit more and the physical aspects that are involved in this type of expedition. Hopefully some of you might see yourselves in some of those types, but moving on, why travel with cork expeditions? There are so many reasons that traveling with cork to the polar regions can really be the experience of a lifetime. This slide just shows some highlights, but I will be going over just a few of these a little bit more in depth to showcase who we are and what we do. So first, and probably the most important thing overall, Quirk Expeditions only does polar. We have only done polar for over 30 years. We have spent three decades and more exploring these regions, looking into every little cove, learning where the best place is to look for leopard seals or for chin strap rookeries, or finding communities in Greenland where we've established wonderful relationships, where we can actually take our travelers to go and meet them. We only do these areas and we're taking all 30 years of experience and making incredible itineraries based off of all of this experience. Here is a quick overview of some of our wonderful achievements that we've had over the years. In 1992, for example, we offered the very first non-scientific visit to emperor penguin recruits at Snow Hill, which is something we are repeating again this year. And I will talk about a little bit later on in the presentation. We were actually the first company to circumnavigate the entire continent of Antarctica on a passenger voyage in 1996. We also circumnavigated the Arctic Ocean in 1999. We have had so many wonderful firsts and achievements, and this is just to showcase how integral we've been in the industry in these areas for as long as we have. What else sets us apart is our expedition guides, our expedition leaders. We have one of the best ratios of our expedition leaders in the industry. We have a ratio of around one expedition leader to seven guests, which is a great, great ratio. Our expedition leaders are our ologists, and these are our scientists. We also have crew, and we count them separately. So the one in seven is just for our expedition guides. These are our ornithologists, our penguinologists, glaciologists, the people that are there to provide context and information and do the lectures and help guide when we're on shore and when we're looking at all of these wonderful destinations. We are told consistently that our expedition guides are some of the best they have ever seen anywhere in the world and that they are absolutely what make our product fantastic. We also have small vessels for more access. This is incredibly important. So we have three different vessels that we operate. I like to say that all of them have different personalities. From our Ocean Adventurer, which is our smallest ship, which has sort of an old ex Expedition ship of old feel with instruments as decorations, maps on the walls, wooden interiors, all the way up to our ultramarine, the one that you see here in the picture, our brand new luxury ship. We have something for everyone. And I did mention small ships, and this is very important. You can see that we range from 128 to 199 guests. And that is because in Antarctica, the vessel size is one of the most important choices that you will make when you take your trip down to Antarctica. For ships that are 501 passengers or more, these are cruise only opportunities. This means the ship will go by the continent, but it will not allow anyone to get off the ship. For ships that have 200 to 500 passengers, they do make landings, but only half of the people can get off at a time. Category one vessels are up to 200 passengers. And this means that everyone can get off the ship at all shore excursions. Cork Expeditions aims for two every single day, one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And because our ships all are under 199 passengers here, we are able to get every single person off at every single excursion. One of other Quark's great, great features is we have a lot of innovative itineraries. This comes from 30 years of experience in these specific regions. Last year, we started our Greenland Adventure Program in Greenland, 
as you can tell by the name, which was incredibly successful. I mentioned Snow Hill. We will be returning to see the Emperor Penguins there this year. Next year, we will talk talk a little bit more about trip in April. Um, it, talking about it starting in April, it will be for 2425, but we have a brand new itinerary in Antarctica to sail and soar the Antarctic continent. We also specialize more than any other company in the off-ship experiences. And I will touch on this a little soon, um, but just know that as much as we love our ships, we really want you off of them as much as possible. We want you to experience the destinations that you're visiting. As wonderful as the vessel is, and as integral as it is to making sure that your experience is comfortable and wonderful, you're there to see the Arctic and Antarctica, and we want to give you as many ways to do so as possible, and we do this with our off-ship experiences. So let's get into the geography of everything and look at the pull of the poles. Where are the polar regions? Where are the areas that we've been talking about? It might sound silly, but it's very good to clarify. When we talk about Arctic, we're looking at the north. I like to joke, polar bears. South, penguins, right? So I also like to joke that Coca-Cola, all of these years at Christmas time has lied to us and that polar bears and penguins are not friends. <laughs> they do not interact. One is very far north, one is very far south. They do not ever interchange. So you can always think of polar bears in the north and penguins in the south. So if we start in the south in Antarctica, let's take a look at some of this geography. Over on the right, we do see a map of Antarctica with the Antarctic Circle, and we can see the peninsula poking up right in the middle. I like to call this the thumb of Africa. And this part just above the Antarctic Circle up to the tip is really all that these ships are basically seeing. There are some itineraries that go down below the Antarctic Circle a bit, but by and large, this is the area that travelers visit. You're not going to great swaths of, of land when you're going to Antarctica to visit. You're really staying just up in the northern bits of the peninsula itself. This is where a lot of the wildlife that you'd see all over the rest of the continent can be found. It's all in these little areas and it's all close together and it makes it so much easier than needing to sail for extremely long distances to see everything spread out. Everything is quite neatly tucked up right in that area. This is a quick map of all of the voyages that we do. You can see that we do also include some options in the Falkland Islands in South Georgia, and we will touch on that momentarily. So how do we get to Antarctica? This is one of the big questions. Most people will take a vessel from Ushuaia. You can see here it is the southernmost city in the world at the tip of Argentina. You cross the Drake Passage and make your way to Antarctica. The Drake Passage has a bit of a reputation for being unruly at times. We like to call it the Drake Shake when it is a bit of an angry voyage, or Drake Lake when it's nice and calm. The voyage takes around 36 hours, give or take, depending on the weather, and it can be a wonderful adventure. It can also be a challenge, especially for those who might get seasick. We do have an alternative way to get there though, and that is by completely avoiding the Drake Passage altogether and flying. Our fly cruise options, rather than leaving from Ushuaia, leave from Punta Arenas in Chile. We board two of these private jets at 70 passengers each, so the journey is capped at 140 passengers. The vessel will be waiting at King George Island, which is a base in the peninsula here, region here. And once the plane lands, you take a Zodiac to the ship, board the ship, and then you go onward with your journey. The beautiful option about this is that you're not missing out on any time on the continent itself. You're only missing out on the Drake Passage sailing portion. So you're not missing any of the ashore excursion experiences, not a single penguin, none of that. <laughs> the nice part about this is that you have a quicker itinerary since you are cutting down about three days of sailing. So for those who maybe don't have quite enough time to do a longer journey, doing the fly cruise option is very helpful. But again, for those who either get seasick or just can't stomach the idea of doing the Drake Passage, this is a wonderful alternative. When to go is such a important question that I get all the time. And the answer is there really is no bad time to go as long as you're going within the November to April region. The seasonality down there is opposite than ours since it is the Southern Hemisphere. So this is actually their summertime. So early in the season, that's when you have the pristine, beautiful ice, lots of ice sheets. 
and you have the mating habits of the penguins to observe. For example, a daily penguins like to give each other pebbles as gifts for the nest. Males will go around, and this is actually a chin strap right here um, in the picture, but the adelies will go around and look for the perfect pebble. They will present it to a female, and if she accepts it, then they put it into the nest for their upcoming chick. It's lovely to see them presenting these presents to each other. You can also start to see some of these baby chicks towards the end of the early season and into the mid season. Once we get into the mid season towards the end of it, you're starting to see more sunsets. Keep in mind because it is summertime and you're so far south, the sun doesn't set. In December, you're getting basically 24 hours of daylight. It does get a little dim and you do get some twilight, especially towards the beginning and end of the seasons, but really it doesn't get dark out. Towards February, though, the sun is low enough in the sky where you get some fantastic sunsets. Towards the end of the season is when you're going to start seeing more whales. You will see whales throughout the whole season, but more of them towards the end. And this is also one of my favorite times for penguins because those adorable little babies have grown into irritating, just grumpy penguin adolescents, and they're molting. They're getting rid of their baby feathers and growing in their adult feathers, and they're uncomfortable, and they just look awkward. And I think it is such a fantastic time to go and see the antics of this already very interesting bird. Where on the continent of Antarctica should we visit? There are a lot of different areas, and we do include Patagonia with this, as we do have one itinerary that does Patagonia exclusively, but there are lots of different ways that you can experience Antarctica. We spoke a bit about the peninsula, but this is where most people will go. Here are a couple of our itineraries that we do offer. In Antarctica, this is our most common itinerary. It is an 11-day down, meandering its way through Antarctica, and then back on up to Ushuaia. For those who liked the idea of the fly cruise, this is the equivalent fly cruise from the first option we just saw basically just taking off that fly time on the Drake Passage. So you would see the exact same amount of things when you land in Antarctica. You just skip that whole Drake Passage portion. For those who want to go a little bit further south, we have a 14-day trip that does go below the Antarctic Circle. This way you have more options for wildlife and you get even further down and more remote than almost any human being has ever been. If you think about the entirety of history and how many humans have been able to explore Antarctica and what a tiny portion actually do go below that circle, it's a fantastic option for people to think about. For those who wanna go a bit longer, we can also add the Falkland Islands and South Georgia. This is our penguin safari our option. I love this itinerary. It is a 16 day. It does not do the Falkland Islands, but it does do South Georgia and then heads on down to Antarctica. So you're not missing out on any of that time on the continent itself. For those who really want to go, we have a 20 day. This is an inclusion with the Falklands and South Georgia, as well as the continent. For those who have a lot of time, we actually do also have this itinerary plus going down below the Antarctic Circle to be 23 days in total. We also are going back to Snow Hill, as I've mentioned several times. Snow Hill is incredibly special as this is one of the only places that you can see emperor penguins. Emperor penguins are the largest species of penguins. They are ginormous. You've probably also seen them in several different documentaries. These guys live way over in the Weddell Sea. If you can see this island that my arrow is pointing to, the majority of all Antarctica tours are going to go on the other side of the continent, to the left side, whereas Snow Hill is over here in the Weddell Sea on the eastern side. So it is a bit more challenging to get to. However, we have our brand new ultramarine with the two twin engine helicopters, which help us to get there. And we are so excited to offer this as a special opportunity for guests in November this year. We do still have a space available. If anyone is interested, please feel free to reach out to myself or to one of the advisors at Market Square Travel. Now that we have an idea of Antarctica, let's hop on up to the top of the world, up to the Arctic. And when we say Arctic, what are we talking about? Here at Quark, we have three main regions, Svalbard, Greenland, and the Canadian Arctic. And we will talk about all three. Here is a map that showcases all of the trips that we do. It is a bit, it's a lot when you first look at it, but if you position yourself, Greenland is right in the middle. We have Spitsbergen over to the right, and we have the Canadian Arctic over to the left. If you look down and left, you can see Canada. 
So that should help you just get oriented with the map. You can see we do really go all over the place in the Arctic. When is the best time to go to the Arctic? Again, this question is so important depending on what it is that you want to experience. And really, there aren't bad times as long as you are within the recommended ranges. So of course, because this is the Northern Hemisphere, we do share the same seasonality and we wanna go in their summertime when there is less ice blocking our way. So that is anywhere from May to September, even into October, depending on the itineraries. Spitsbergen, we'll talk a little bit more in just a moment about why each of these destinations are unique, but Spitsbergen is best between May and July. That's when the ice that supports polar bears and their habitat and, and how they hunt is best, and it's easiest to see the bears at that time. Greenland is best in July to October to really take advantage of those summer months and the light in the sky and the wonderful adventure opportunities available. And the Canadian Arctic, because it is so far north, we need that ice to be receded way back up. So we're looking at August to September so that we can actually make it to these destinations in the north so that they are not blocked by sea ice. Let's take a look at each of those destinations just a little more closely and see what there is to see. Let's start with Spitsbergen. Spitsbergen is usually what people think of as the default when they think of visiting the Arctic. This is the most popular spot to go. We do consider this the realm of the polar bear, as this is one of the best places in the world to see our polar bear friends. So Spitsbergen, as we can see, is an archipelago. It is way up in there in the, north, in the Arctic Circle. The capital is Longyearbyen. And the interesting part about Svalbard versus the rest of the Canadian, or excuse me, the rest of the Arctic, is that there isn't as much of a human history here. The Canadian Arctic and Greenland have had human settlements and history there for thousands of years, upwards of. And Svalbard didn't have people until about 100, 120 years ago. So it's relatively new. Most of the people that come here for travel like to see the city of Longyearbyen. It is the northernmost city in the world as a contrast to Ushuaia in the south. So there is an interesting lifestyle, but it's really for the wildlife and the beautiful features. So we are looking at things like zodiacs, cruising by icebergs, looking at amazing mountains, going on shore to see wildlife and other cool, cool opportunities. And there's also some human history. There are people who have built shelters throughout the land where people who were either hunting early on or mining or doing scientific research had actual structures to go to to stay safe. Keep in mind, polar bears are very dangerous in this area. It's hard to do exploration safely. You have to always keep the bears in mind. So these structures are one way that people throughout time and now even today, we'll use these as protection from bears and also just as shelter in these areas. As you can imagine, there is not a lot of human civilization outside of Long Yerbian. There are some pockets, but for the most part, this is all wildlife and wilderness. So polar bears are of course, the main thing that people are drawn to up here. There are lots of other things as well, as I mentioned with the history. But there's also other types of wildlife besides the bears. Arctic reindeer are everywhere. They look a little bit different than the reindeer that we're used to. They're a little stockier, their legs are a little shorter. They're very cute though, they are everywhere. There's Arctic fox, we have seals, walrus, certain types of whales, and so many kinds of birds. And depending on the season you go, there's also flora. There's actually color here in the Arctic with the flowers that grow, especially July, August into the seasons there. So a couple of itineraries that go through Svalbard from us. We have our Spitsbergen Explorer. This is a seven day. This is a very quick one. If you don't have a lot of time, this is a great one to do. Only seven days. We can go all the way up to 12 days and even into 14. The biggest difference is just how far we're able to get through the archipelago. I also like to highlight that we have some specialized tours, including photography tours, and this is a wonderful one. You spend 14 days meandering the Svalbard area, looking for the best photography examples possible, um, going to the most beautiful spots in this whole area. If we move over to the Canadian Arctic next, you can see we're headed way over in the north of Canada, very, very high up. So what is there to see up here? 
We have all sorts of beautiful natural history, geological features, and people. This is one of the biggest highlights is meeting people in the Arctic. We have wonderful history as well. Um, Franklin, for example, is an explorer that we at Cork highly admire, and we have even named an itinerary after him, which we will look at in a moment. So in this part of the world, it's a little bit more relaxed. We don't have polar bears as much over in this area. So you're going to see a little bit more of the friendly wildlife. Uh, you've got your walruses, your hares, your flax. They will also still have reindeer, musk ox, all sorts of different things that you can see. Wildlife is usually not the main feature, a lot of it is going to be for the history and the culture, as the wildlife isn't always as prevalent in these areas, depending on the type of year you go, but the wildlife you do see is just spectacular. So quickly going over a couple of itinerary options, for those who want to see some of the most remote islands in the world, Bishi Island, Ellesmere Island, this is a great itinerary. This is a nine day trip in and out of Calgary. So you basically just have to get to Calgary and we will include the flight up to Resolute and you get to see the heart of this area of the Arctic. We have a longer itinerary. This is a 12 day that goes up to Axel Heiberg as well um, and just does a bit more off the beaten path. And I mentioned that we admire Franklin. This is in the footsteps of Franklin, which recreates the Northwest Passage in from basically Toronto out to Calgary. So again, we make the flights nice and easy for you. And this is the route that Franklin took as he was discovering his way through the Northwest Passage. Hopping over to Greenland. As you can see, it is the huge island here. And what do we see here? Huge ice, lots and lots of ice, big glaciers. We have the Greenlandic ice sheet, for example. We have a lot of human history as well. And on the Eastern side, we do have polar bears. So one of the biggest highlights in Greenland is our community visits. We do have great relationships with the communities, several communities within Greenland and Canada. And they have invited us to bring our guests so that you can interact with them, see what it's like to live in Greenland and basically just get a whole new perspective of living in the Arctic. One of our brand new itineraries that we are so excited for is our Gems of West Greenland. West Greenland really focuses on what is biggest and best on this island. So we start in Umanak, where we can see a lot of wonderful human history and some communities as well down in the south in Sisamute. We have several opportunities to visit people there. In Disco Bay in Ilulisat, this is where we have some of the largest icebergs that really do rival those down in Antarctica. So not only are you getting human history and beautiful outdoor adventure, you are getting it in a spectacular place altogether. We have an essential Greenland option for 15 days for those who want to add in the southern portion of Greenland as well. We have a Northern Lights tour. If we want to start expanding the areas that we go to, this is over in Eastern Greenland. In and out of Reykjavik, we sail up to Itikatormiut and then into Milne Island. And we get to see some of the most beautiful fjords in the world. Scoresby Sand has some of the largest fjords rivaling both Norway and New Zealand. This trip helps you to see amazing scenery and we hope will also include Northern Lights depending on how the activity is during those sailings. We also have a three Arctic island tour. This was named one of National Geographic Traveler's 50 tours of a lifetime, starting in Reykjavik, going up to Itikatormiut again, so in Eastern Greenland to see those beautiful fjords, and then on up to Svalbard, so we can look for polar bears and other amazing wildlife. And then if three islands is not enough, we also have four. This one adds in Jan Mayen, which is a birder's paradise. Really quickly, I just wanted to show you our fleet. We talked a little bit about our ships, but I wanted to just showcase the three that we have. This is our ocean adventurer. She is our smallest at 128 guests. This is the one that I mentioned feels more of an expedition of old. The World Explorer is our mid-range ship. She is an all balconies um, ship with either French balconies or full balconies. Recently renovated and just beautiful. 172 guests, six stories, lots of dining, a beautiful observation lounge. This one really kind of mixes up between luxury and adventure, I think. And then here are some nice pictures of the insides. And then lastly, we have our Ultramarine. Ultramarine is our brand new ship. We built her custom made for the polar regions. You can see she comes with two helicopters, which is one of the biggest highlights 
that the ship offers. It's the access. So those helicopters allow us to get you off the ship deeper into the polar regions. Here are just some pictures of the interior. One of the concerns we do get is how uncomfortable will it be going down to these regions? And as you can see from these pictures, it can be quite luxurious and very comfortable. So when you're on the ship, what, are, what do you expect? We will always include certain activities, right? So we're always going to include hiking. This is a polar plunge for all of you brave souls. We do Zodiac cruising, we have photography on board, and then we have our helicopter options for those on the ultramarine. For those when you're on board, things that we offer include things like nature and wildlife viewing. We have people on call looking for bears, looking for penguins, looking for spectacular things at all times, and they will absolutely let you know when it's time to look outside to see something wonderful. We do daily briefings and recaps with all of our ologists again with our expedition crew. They will be doing recaps of things we saw and also telling us information about what's coming up. We do onboard learning with our expedition team as well, always, and lots of opportunities to connect, especially now post-COVID. We are back to being all together and able to be doing things as a group again. The food on board is excellent. We have different restaurants available and we can fit almost all cuisine types. And we do also have exercise and wellness for those who would like to keep up their training while on board. Lounges and bars, of course. And this is the spa on the ultramarine. So when we do get you off the ship, here are a couple of pictures of those things I mentioned that are included. The polar plunge, hiking, zodiac rides, the helicopter. For the optional activities, these are all things you can add on to make your adventures just a little bit more exciting. We have things like stand-up paddling, kayaking, paddling programs. And in Antarctica, we even have camping. We unfortunately can't do camping in most of the Arctic because of polar bears. But in Antarctica, it's a very wonderful experience to say that you actually slept on the continent itself, not just next to it. In the Arctic, we have even more adventure activities because again, there is less ice, more land, and the areas that we do this, no polar bears, thank goodness. So again, we have kayaking. When we do the North Pole, we have an included balloon ride. We're hoping to get back to the North Pole soon. We shall see. We also use our helicopters to do things like camping, hiking, snowshoeing, skiing, biking, all sorts of different activities. And here's just a quick little pictorial of all of those activities. These are all choices of things that you can do when you travel with us. So very quickly, that is what I have for you today. I wanted to make sure that we did a quick overview of who we are, what we do, and there's so much more that I can talk about and tell you. But for now, I think that this is a good place to start. Do we have any questions for now, Kelly? I don't see anything that has come through, but wow, this was a great overview and a lot of information. And I don't know how you didn't inspire one to travel <laughs> to the polar regions with this, but thank you so much for having us today. And this was fantastic. I think Absolutely. everybody knows what it's like to travel with Cork now. So thank you so much, everybody for attending. And we will have this recording available. Thank you so much, everyone, for the time that you took either in person or later on if you're watching this as a recording. I so appreciate all of your support. I am here to help answer any questions as necessary. And Kelly, thank you again for organizing this and being such a wonderful host. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.